Good afternoon, everyone. We will start in just a moment. Hi, everyone. Hey, welcome to today's webinar on cell phones. Welcome to your webinar. This is just for you guys. And I want to welcome you. Hello. Very friendly group. It's going to be terrific. So it uh, looks like, oh, wow. Okay. So uh, before we, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, before we get going, uh, I think I know the answer already because you, you found the chat. But uh, would somebody mind just letting me know that you can uh, see my screen and hear my voice? I want to get make certain everything is good on on your end. And before we get going, I don't want to get in the middle of this uh, our presentation and then realize that there were audio issues or anything else. So I'm pretty certain they're they're it's going to be just fine uh, based on the feedback. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. That is awesome. You guys are terrific. Uh, that's great. So, all right. Wow. A lot of feedback. This is really good. So, terrific. I appreciate that. So, uh, what I'm going to do, uh, the last few of these webinars, we've had connection issues. If you have connection issues, there's a button at the top of your screen where you can reconnect. Uh, give that a shot. But really what I found what I believe to be the case is that I'm doing video. Video is coming across the wire as well as audio. So I'm going to cut my video off and hopefully we won't even have that issue. So uh, I am here. I am a live person. And uh, so uh, right now I'm in the bottom portion of your screen, but uh, I'm going to turn that off so that uh, we don't have any issues at all. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that off now. Um, uh, you guys know, because uh, you found it, you found the chat box on the right-hand side of the uh, of your screen. Uh, that is terrific. I'll go over a few other housekeeping things in just a moment when we, uh, in, in just a couple of slides here. But uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, thank you. Appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend it with me. And uh, you picked the best, uh, most popular webinar we have, which is on cell phones. So... Uh, that is awesome. Okay, so let's get going. I am Pete James, a director of digital forensics at Archer Hall. And today we're going to be talking about cell phone forensics. Uh, if you haven't heard of Archer Hall, that's okay. You, uh, you're probably the only contact so far you've had with Archer Hall are our emails asking you uh, to attend a webinar like this one. Uh, but we have been around for 20 years. We are based in Northern California, in Sacramento. Uh, we do have team members in, uh, of course, Northern California, Southern California, and uh, Arizona. Uh, but we help clients all over the country. Uh, we have uh, remote collection kits that we send out. Uh, we can even collect cell phones. Most people don't want to give up their cell phones for longer than a couple hours. So what we do is uh, we design a kit that we send out. It has computer cables. A webcam and uh, we work with the person on the uh, other side to uh, make the connections we run the software collect all the data and ship it back so uh, with more and more data being in a cloud as well we do uh, those collections so a little bit about me before we jump into uh, cell phones and data and location information and all that fun uh, I have been doing forensics for about 10 years I did spend 27 years in law enforcement I was with the Sacramento uh, Sheriff's Department in Northern California. I do have a half a dozen computer forensic certificates. Uh, I have experience working forensics cases on the criminal side, of course, from my law enforcement career, civil, uh, working as a consultant for the last five years, uh, like, like right now, and corporate. I used to work for a Fortune 50 corporation doing uh, e-discovery forensics and investigations for them. I have testified as an expert witness in the state and federal court as well as on the civil side. Uh, a few of those housekeeping things that I mentioned earlier. 
Uh, three hours from now, you'll get a link to a video. Um, three hours from now, you're going to get an email. In that email, is going to be a link to this video, so you'll be able to watch this uh, over and over again if you want. 24 hours from now, you're going to get another email, and that email is going to be a link to the PDF version of this presentation and your uh, MCLE or CLE certificate, which will prove to the State Bar that you spent the last hour with me. Uh, we do have a chat box. You found the chat box. You can send me a chat privately, uh, or you can post it to the uh, entire group. So, um, you guys, have, many of you have already found that. That's terrific. Uh, feel free to ask any question uh, along the way. And uh, as we get toward the end of the presentation, I'm going to be showing you some uh, screenshots. Of, uh, essentially, it's how to get uh, some of the information. So there's a lot of information on there. Don't worry about taking notes, at least as far as what's on the screen, because you're going to get a copy of that, um, of the presentation. So you'll have a copy of it to go back and refer to. Uh, I threw a poll out there just to kind of get an idea of uh, how you are connected to today's webinar. I, if you can answer that poll, I'd appreciate it. And uh, it's uh, under your chat box. Oh, sorry. Okay, I have to press publish. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, I had created it and then uh, got it ready to go. I just needed to press one more button to allow you to answer the questions. So, uh, terrific. And it looks like answers are coming in. I can't see your individual answers. I can just see the, the total answers being. Uh, I mean, it looks like uh, the overwhelming majority are on a desktop or a laptop. I'll tell you what we found which was surprising to us is that many are watching this presentation on their cell phone. So uh, that information is useful for us because you know, we have graphics, we have text, and we um, uh, so we need to design our, our presentations a little different if we're going to have, you know, if people are going to be watching it on a smaller screen. So it does look like a few of you are connected with tinfoil hat. Um, see, you guys are a fun group because most people, they don't, nobody answers that, but uh, I can tell you guys are, you guys are a, a fun group. You got you pre pre probably have a pretty fun Christmas party too. Okay. So, um, I'm going to end that poll. Looks like the overwhelming majority are actually on a, uh, on your own. So. All right, I'm going to go through a few more slides here, and then I'm going to throw another poll out. Then at the very end, I'll have another poll, just one more poll, just to get your feedback uh, and, and uh, ask you what you found most valuable there. So let's jump into this. Okay, and I will, will remind you again, this is your presentation. I will go in whatever direction you want. You ask me... Uh, any question about forensics or cell phones or uh, location information, anything, feel free to uh, ask a question and I will uh, do my best to answer that for you. All right, uh, we have an agenda because state bars like agendas. Uh, we're going to talk about why cell phone data is important. I'm going to answer some common questions that we always get asked about cell phones. Uh, one of the questions is how far back is data saved on that cell phone? Can you get emails from cell phones? And then we're going to talk about metadata. I'll explain metadata in a moment, but uh, we're going to talk um, part of metadata is location information. Location information can be really important in cases, but there's so much location information, I split it up into uh, location data that's created on the cell phone and then stored on that cell phone and then stored somewhere else. Uh, the reason is you go different places to look for it. So you know, the first part of figuring out what's going on is you know, what information do I want? And then where is it? So um, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up with how to get it. And so I'm gonna uh, throw out one more poll. And unfortunately, I can't pre-populate these, so I have to just do it manually. But I'm just cutting and pasting from uh, a document that I already have. We're ready to go here. <laughs> Go ahead and throw that one out here. Just give me an idea of uh, your familiarity with uh, with cell phone data. 
So while you answer that, so good. Looks like uh, so far most of you uh, several times already. Terrific. Okay, so while you answer that, uh, we'll go ahead and go through a few more of these. So we're going to talk about, okay, the answer, okay, why is cell phone data is important. Uh, it's important uh, just like any other piece of evidence in your case. It is, um, um, it, it's no different. You're going to use it to support a claim or theory, uh, to show a different version of events, uh, discredit a witness, or to point the finger at somebody else. So no different than anybody than any other um, piece of information. And um, so uh, let's answer the first question. How far back is data saved on a cell phone? Um, in this presentation today, I'm going to use as an example my own cell phone. I this is this is good for us to do because I know what to expect, I know what's normal, and I, I know what's abnormal, so I know you know what to you know, what to look at a little uh, more carefully. And uh, we use a software uh, program called Celebrite. Uh, Celebrite is not the only cell phone software program out there, but it is the most popular. I used it when I was in law enforcement, widely used in law enforcement, as well as the military, three-letter agencies. Uh, it's used internationally. Uh, Celebrite is actually based in Israel, and they are, you know, pretty much the top dog with cell phone uh, software. So. We use that software to pull the data off of our phone and create an image. <clears throat> so when we pull data off of a phone or like a computer, uh, us forensics people, we refer to that as an image. Now this is different than a picture, uh, it's kind of interchangeable, but we create an image of the phone. So that's an exact copy of the data on the phone. Um, so I use cell phone, I use Celebrate to create the image, and then that software also helps us with analysis. It processes the data, it categorizes all the data, and then presents it to us so that we can uh, take a look at it and you know, figure out what was going on with, the, uh, with what the user was doing. So to, uh, I'm going to go back to, I reset that poll, I'm going to go back to the chat. So, all right, I was just reading, I was just reading the comments or, or the, uh, the messages. So, uh, how far back is data safe? So this depends on uh, many things, depends. Um, and, it, and if you talk to a lot of forensics people, uh, you will hear some common answers. Uh, usually the answers are sometimes, maybe, and it depends. And we're not trying to skirt the issue. We're not trying to not uh, answer the question. It's just that technology is changing every single day, and we can have a certain version of software like Celebrite that pulls uh, very specific information from a cell phone. When that cell phone is of a certain make and model, running a certain software with apps or software that can then, um, um, that, that are running a, a certain version of the software. Tomorrow, all of that can change. A new operating system can come out. A new version of an app software can come out and change everything. So uh, we can tell you, well, in the past, we have been able to recover this information. But you know, we don't want to overpromise and then tell you absolutely certainly we can get this when we may not. Now, in generalities, we can do a pretty good job of pulling everything, nearly everything, off of a cell phone. There are some specific circumstances where, let's say, you know, WhatsApp comes out with a new uh, software, gets uh, updated, and then we can't we can't do it. Other settings, some you can you can set your text messages to delete automatically delete after 90 days, and for the most part, they're gone and not recoverable. Um, if you're the older the software, generally the better. We can the more data we can pull off, but uh, you know, so there are many variables in that. With um, with my phone, uh, so I mentioned I'm going to use my phone as an example. I switched from a BlackBerry to an iPhone in 2008. Along the way, my when I upgraded to a new model, I've used the 
computer-based iTunes to back up and then restore my um, uh, restore the data to the phone. I also generally don't delete much. Uh, I, I do tend to be a pack rat, not not as bad as this picture, but I do generally tend to not delete data. I think it's the forensics person in me that just never really wants to delete anything because once it's gone, it's gone. So what's on my phone? Uh, I have pictures taken uh, that go all the way back to 2008, uh, text messages from 2011, IP connections from 2011. So IP stands for Internet Protocol. In a network, every single device on a network needs a unique number. When we're talking about the Internet, that number is an IP connection. This is important for um, on the forensic side because when we get the information about what was going on, what somebody was doing, uh, interacting with the website, interacting on the network, we generally will get the date and the time that the that whatever was going on and the IP address of the device on the network that was connected at that time. So IP connections are very important. Uh, cookies from 2011. So as you know, cookies are those small text files that end up on your computer when you browse to certain websites. But with a phone, with a mobile device, cookies are also created and updated when you're using apps or software, right? Uh, so those can be very useful. But let's say, you know, WhatsApp. Uh, the allegation is they were using WhatsApp to communicate. We download the phone. There is no WhatsApp uh, software on the phone but yet there's a cookie from it. So that could be useful to say, well, one time, WhatsApp had to be on the phone because there's cookies on there, as just an example. Um, at email metadata from 2018, uh, we'll talk in a few moments, in a few slides, about uh, email on, uh, on your device and whether or not we can capture it. If not, we can generally at least capture a log and the log, of course, is just showing activity. Um, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. Also, only going back to 2019 are call logs and web history. So call logs are an example of one of those files on, on your phone. And your computer has these as well. They are logs. So they're logging activity, and they only get to a certain size. So for example, your call log. Your call log is going to show a call made, called received, or called missed. We're going to get a date and a time. We're going to get a uh, the two phone numbers, right? The caller and the receiver, whether it's us or someone else. And then we're going to get a duration of the time, how long that call lasted. We're not going to get, of course, the actual call, right? That's not being recorded. This is just a call log. So this call log only stores, let's say, for example, 500. Think of an Excel spreadsheet where you have on the left-hand side a date and a time, you have the two phone numbers, the sender receiver, and then you have the duration. It's kind of what it looks like. So you have uh, 500 entries, you have 500 Excel lines. Once it gets to the 501st, the oldest one rolls off. So that's why we always encourage you to collect uh, evidence or at least preserve the evidence as soon as you think you're going to need it because through no direct purposeful deletion, the data may not be there when you when you go to look for it. Uh, just through normal use, it just gets deleted. Same with Windows logs. There are Windows uh, logs, Mac, the same thing. They only get so good. So the sooner you can get it, the better. Any questions so far about what we've gone over before we, uh, before we continue? I do see a question about what program to recommend to use, clients use to submit text conversations. Um, when we create a report with Celebrite, we can show it uh, similar to what you would see in, as what you see on your phone with the bubbles, you know, the green or the blue bubble and the conversations back and forth. So that is something that can be produced from Celebrite. I hope that 
answered your question. If it didn't, please hit me up again, and I will. Um, I'll answer that question. So I mentioned Celebrate. Uh, this is a screenshot of a Celebrate of Celebrate uh, analysis on my phone. So you can see a lot of different categories of data in there. A couple things I want to point out under chats. You see it says 1,115, and then to the right it says 53, and it's in red. That red is deleted and recovered. Um, but not to get your hopes up, sometimes deleted text messages don't include the whole entire record. So again, think of an Excel spreadsheet where you have a date and a time, you're going to have a sender and receiver, and yeah, that's going to be based on phone number, and then you're going to get the message, the actual body that matches the text that you send. Now, for the 1,000, now, when you're dealing with us collecting the data from the phone and uh, putting it into a category where it's understandable to us humans, that is what we're going to see. We're going to see being the time, a sender receiver, and the body of the message. But when you're dealing with deleted, you may not get all of those. You may not get, um, uh, you may not get the whole entire record of that, which means every single one of those uh, cells. If you're thinking of an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you may get a sender and a receiver, but no body of the message or no date and time. Or you may get a date and a time and no sender receiver and no message. So it's kind of hit and miss when you're, when you're dealing with deleted. Uh, the reason is in the background, you've deleted that message. Your operating system, your phone thinks this is no good. I don't need this anymore. It kind of, it, it doesn't really keep records of it anymore. When we use our forensic software, we're pulling that out, but it may not, the whole entire thing may not be there. This is that chat's uh, blown up a little bit. You can see it categorizes these Facebook Messenger, iMessages, which are communications between two Apple devices, uh, even Instagram and WhatsApp. So these are all different uh, chats that are um, that are broken down. Uh, for contacts, it shows you know, 3,586. I don't have that many friends, but what it's doing is it's going through the phone and it's looking at anything that could be an account uh, name or or anything like you know you add up all of instagram uh, accounts or facebook accounts or any any type of contact information that's what that is pulling from so from an investigative point of view it's terrific for uh, privacy not so much but uh, that's another subject cookies i mentioned cookies earlier uh, those small text files that end up on your browser or phone when you use an app or they end up uh, after using a browser uh, I tend to have a lot of apps, and you can see I have 11,000 cookies. So again, from a forensics investigative point of view, there's a lot of information there to be able to um, to capture. And um, uh, and I mentioned earlier, you know, let's say somebody had deleted their their app, there may very well still be cookies there, still there. Device locations. I mentioned that uh, uh, travel. And I use Apple just because you know very common phone. We get a lot of um, iPhones, but Androids have the same thing. They have similar uh, similar categories of information. Uh, travel is can is uh, is what they call are are called journeys in phones. So uh, travel with a device is is categorized under journeys, and you can see many different categories. Everything from using Apple Maps to even Uber and Waze. Uh, I see a couple questions, so let me get to those. Uh, if a picture is deleted, is it recoverable? Uh, maybe. Uh, it depends on what, uh, on, on many factors, the phone that they're using, um, how long it's been since they've deleted, and if it still could possibly be there. Um, most of the time, yes. But the answer may be no. It just really depends. But if there was a, a specific uh, picture that was important, I would uh, probably ask a few more questions. Was it texted to somebody? Um, we, are, we are just finishing up a case uh, back in the office where a, uh, the, the allegation was that a video was taken, of, that a video was taken at a, between a certain date and time. And they said, the user said, no, I never took a video. Well, 
we're getting ready to give the results to the attorney uh, uh, this afternoon. Because of the way that iPhones uh, capture and save data, uh, when you take a picture, each additional picture is named chronologically. So image 001, image 002, image 003, each one of those is safe. Now, if there's a gap, it means that there was a picture taken and then deleted. And that's exactly what we found. Now, you know, that's at the, at the very high level of what we can do. So we can sort all the data by file name and see that there was a gap. Then we can also sort it by date and time chronologically and then uh, fill in the blanks and see. And, and that's so we're able to say a, a photo was taken, a video was taken, or a screenshot was taken between this date and time and it's no longer there. We know that because there's a missing number there. So, uh, emails, so can you get emails from phones? It depends. Uh, just because you're viewing uh, emails on your on your cell phone uh, doesn't mean it's stored there. So generally they're cloud-based, they are being stored up in the cloud, you're just viewing them on your phone. For regular phone collections, when we when we pull the data off the phone, we generally are not going to collect emails. But there are some circumstances where with some Apple devices running slightly older software, we can use a, a certain method to pull the data off. It's called Checkmate. And it actually uh, retrieves anywhere between, my testing, anywhere between three times and ten times the amount of data we can pull off. So imagine you know, we do a regular collection and we get 10 gigabytes of data. Imagine getting 100 gigabytes from the phone. So much more information, so much more data, and emails are included in those if we can if we can use that specific method to pull data off. And, and the reason I like Celebrate so much is they've been a leader in, in using and creating that. Uh, in creating that. But even if we can't get that, even if we can't get uh, all of that information, uh, the actual emails, what you're looking at on the screen here is a log of that activity. And this log is uh, is of emails. So what you have here is a date and a time, a sender receiver, but we don't have the actual message of the, um, the email sent. We don't have the body, right? We don't have the actual message, but we have a log. So this could be important. Let's say there's a, a critical email and you go to the email account and we collect it and it's not there. You go to the other half of that communication and it's not there. So, but if you can get this log from this phone, then what you're gonna be able to say is, well, that email at one time existed. It's been deleted because here's the log. We don't have the body of the email, but we have a log showing that it's there. So um, I'm gonna talk about metadata and I, and I see some questions coming in. Thank you, I appreciate um, can I send links to some of the programs we use? Absolutely. Uh, although Celebrite um, is is very expensive. It's like twelve or fourteen thousand to buy first off, and then it's about three or four thousand dollars a year just to keep it up uh, up and running. But when we do a Celebrite extraction and we provide the report to the client, we provide you the reader, and a reader will allow you to uh, go through the data. Uh, just like we do. So if if you um, if your uh, forensics provider is using uh, Celebrite, make certain you ask them for the reader. They will know you're talking about. It's just reader, R E A D E R. It's a program that allows you to look at the data much like much like I do. Um, if an older phone has a password that cannot be recovered, can you access the phone data? Uh, it, that's kind of a long shot. Sometimes. Uh, the older the phone, the more likely we are to be able to get past it. If, if we have a newer device, there are some other things we can do um, to try and figure out what the passcode is. If we have access to um, the phone and it, uh, or the computer where it was backed up, um, that can be helpful. But generally, we do need the, uh, the passcode. And in working, when I was in law enforcement, we, um, it was different. Here on the civil side, if we get a phone, we let them know we need another passcode to be able to get in. And um, uh, 
uh, is a cell phone always running some type of location software regardless if it's taking the towers? I'll talk about that in just a moment. That's a great question. Uh, pretty much, yes, you're being followed all the time. When uh, when people use uh, phone finder apps and wipe their phone, can that data be recovered? No. If you if you wipe your phone, if you do the uh, uh, the remote wipe or uh, reset your phone, it's gone. There's nothing that can be done for that. I've done tests and I've seen phones and uh, that have been wiped and imaged them anyway, and we don't get anything from them. So that's why the first thing we do when we get a phone is we either um, go into airplane mode or we pop the SIM card out. The SIM card is that little, um, it's in a little tray that pops out from the side of your phone and it makes the connection. Uh, but yeah, the first thing we do uh, is, is stop that connection because we don't want somebody logging into their computer at home and sending the remote wipe uh, because that would, it's gone. Okay, uh, metadata. So I'm gonna talk about metadata. Um, Briefly, uh, metadata is data about data or like the data that you can't see. For a typical Microsoft product like Word or Excel or PowerPoint, we're gonna get the date and time the file was created. If it was updated, the modified date is going to show, uh, is going to show that. The total editing time, sometimes the name of the author and maybe even the last time it was sent to a printer. So that's a typical metadata on a, on a regular file. Uh, for email, it's in the email header. And what that's doing is it's capturing the travel uh, from the sender to the receiver as it goes through uh, mail servers, which are just computers in the cloud uh, designed specifically to move mail. Sometimes though, email metadata, we can tell you whether they were using a browser like Chrome or Firefox, or if they were using a client like Office 365 or Outlook, or uh, pictures, a lot of the metadata is going to be the date and time that the picture was taken. For a cell phone, it's going to show the make and the model of the phone. Sometimes if the flash went off, if uh, if it was a horizontal or portrait mode, those kind of things. But great part about pictures is the GPS location as well. Celebrite uh, categorizes this for us and puts it on a map. If this was this is just a screenshot, but if this were a live uh, if I were in the program, I could zoom in and get more information about location, exactly where the device was when those how the picture was taken. So you're looking at a map of the U.S. The numbers in the red dots are the number of images or pictures taken around that location. Uh, if you look up in Washington and Idaho, you see some satellite-looking pin drops. Uh, those are Wi-Fi connections. So I mentioned I used my phone for this exam, and there are a few things that uh, jumped out at me that I didn't understand exactly how they got on my phone. So we're gonna take a look at those and uh, figure out how they uh, how they got there. So along the way, we're gonna, we're gonna go over some metadata that we'll start on the, on the west in Idaho, that Wi-Fi connection. So I've never been to Idaho, and I don't know how that, how that artifact, how that got on my phone. But when I looked at the date and time and the location of where exactly it came back to, it came back to an airport. And I realized that I was on a Southwest flight connected to the Wi-Fi. We had a brief layover in Boise when we rolled up to the terminal, made that connection. So that was on there, which I said I had never been to Idaho, but my phone has a better memory than me uh, because I had been to Idaho. This... Uh, uh, the, the lower red arrow is uh, comes back to a park in uh, Washington DC and when I looked at this I'm like I haven't been I haven't been to uh, Washington DC or Boston in decades and uh, so I didn't know how these artifacts got on my phone but when I when I looked at it uh, and we can in celebrate like other forensic software we can sort everything by date and time. Uh, when I did that, I saw that I saw what was going on. Uh, I had been using a browser to uh, see, uh, look at a news site. The news site was spacefieldnow.com, had the date and time that's on there. And I know that because there's a cookie. There was a cookie created when I went to that news site. And then 
I thought that the story was interesting. I sent a link in a text. You can see at the very bottom, instant message at the date and time. It was from me to somebody else, and it has the link. So you know when you put links of websites in um, text messages or any kind of message, it will show you the um, it'll show you a small thumbnail image of that news story. That's what that's what that was. That's what that um, that picture is that you see on the screen. So I was in Washington D.C. at that time, of course, but because the GPS coordinates of the thumbnail image came back to Washington, D.C., it put that artifact on my phone. Uh, this is one of the pictures from Arkansas. I've never been to Arkansas, but if you take those coordinates and put it into a mapping program, it's going to come right back to, uh, uh, to Arkansas. Now, I can tell you by looking at chat messages that this came to me as an attachment and a message. But I can also tell you by where on on the phone um, this is. And uh, if you look in the red box below, Pete's iPhone, that's me, mobile library SMS, uh, which is short for text messaging, and then attachments. So this came to me as an attachment. Uh, this is a uh, short for company, and they had an office in Denver. And these are pictures taken from that location. Now, GPS can be very accurate, especially if you're using health apps or Fitbits, those kind of things. But I was just using my phone as a camera. And all of the pictures were taken on the south side of that street. This shows a spread of about 200 yards. You know, so it's fairly accurate, but not, not extremely accurate. Uh, this is an example of one of the pictures taken uh, looking out to the uh, northwest. And uh, so my point here is that it's pretty accurate, but it's not super, super accurate. This is what the metadata looks like on the right-hand side. You'll see the image number, uh, the file number, the name of the picture, 84, 54. Remember, I was saying that Apple devices add incrementally every single time you take a new picture. So we have here uh, uh, the path, Pete's iPhone, mobile media, DCIM, which is digital camera image and then um, the Apple in um, the Apple folder, 108 Apple. So I can tell you just from the file location that I took this with my phone on the bottom part of the metadata shows Apple iPhone 6 Plus, which is what I had at the time back in 2015, and it shows some additional information in the lat long is at the very bottom. Uh, one other thing to point out about pictures and file location is uh, this is one of those pictures from that location, but you see the second line down where it says mutations. So the file path is Pete's iPhone, mobile media, photo data, mutations. I cropped this photo, so when you crop a photo, it gets saved in the file location mutation. So a couple of things uh, that we forensics people can look at and help us figure out exactly what was going on at the time. The metadata as well, iPhone 6 Plus has a date and a capture time. 2017 and uh, GPS coordinates there. I mentioned earlier that journeys are how Apple categorizes travel. And this is just one example of what we would see when we're looking at Apple Maps. We have a starting and ending date and time and a starting and ending uh, GPS coordinates. Now, GPS data is great and uh, it's very, for the most part, accurate. And, but sometimes we can't necessarily get, uh, you know, the information just isn't there for the specific time that we're looking for. But that doesn't mean there aren't other artifacts on your phone that could be helpful with your case. Uh, this is an example of one of them. This is the health app. Now, I never opted in for this, but it just decided to keep all this. And you can see here there's 23,000 lines of records being kept. Now, what we have here is a starting and ending date and time and then an, act, uh, an activity, and, it's, and the activity is listed under value. So what we have here under value is 259 steps, and we have a starting time and an ending time. Now, this doesn't have GPS coordinates of where the phone was when these 259 steps were taken, but um, this could be helpful if, let's say, 
you know, a client or a person says, yeah, they were, they were in bed sleeping from, you know, midnight to 8 a.m. Uh, they never went anywhere. Well, maybe, maybe the health app shows, you know, 400 or 500 steps. You know, that's more than just a quick, you know, walk around the house. Uh, so this could be useful as well. Other artifacts also that may be useful, but don't give exact GPS information, and this is, this is all being pulled from the phone, are Bluetooth connections. So Bluetooth is a wireless protocol that connects two devices together uh, wirelessly. You generally have to be within 10 to 15 yards of each other to create and maintain that connection. You can see here, this is a log of my uh, Bluetooth connection. See, I have over 1,000 entries, and they look like this. I just grabbed a couple of them. What we have is a date and a time of uh, when that connection was made, the name of the device that was connected, and then the device identifier is essentially like a serial number. So that is uh, that is uh, helpful for us to actually tie it back. Now, what we don't have is the actual GPS location of where either one of those devices were when that when that connection was made. But if through other investigative methods, you can put a device at a certain location at a certain date and time near when this connection was made, then you can say the phone had to be within 10 to 15 yards when that when that connection was made. For example, you know, many of our Bluetooth devices are small, like wireless speakers, uh, but they can be uh, computers and they can be vehicles that you can connect you to your vehicle. Now, if it's important, let's say you have a Bluetooth connection that you made with a vehicle, if you can put that vehicle at a certain date and time some other way, either through interviews or other video, then again, you can say your phone had to be within 10 to 15 yards to make that connection. So before we jump into the next part, I have some questions here. Thank you. Uh, if we talked about cropped, if, if the photo is cropped and then the cropped image is deleted, uh, will the original image still be there? Yes, it should be there, uh, unless uh, unless that was deleted as well. But your answer is uh, yes, it should be. All right, thank you for the questions. Any other questions before we jump into the next part of the presentation? We're going to talk about cell towers and and that. Right. And while I wait for those questions, I'm just uh, I think the final poll is ready. So I'll have that ready to go when we finish up. Again, these poll questions are very useful to us because what we think is important, what we think you want to know, is not necessarily what you find important. So we really appreciate you answering those. I'll get that out. Uh, when we wrap it up. So, okay, no questions. I'll go ahead and continue on. Talk about cell tower data, the cell site location. So our phones are very needy. They are constantly reaching out to a cell tower to create and maintain that connection. Uh, now, not all of those records are being saved because you can imagine there's a lot of uh, a lot of those records. But when there is data transferred, those records are being captured. Data transferred meaning you're on a call, you're sending, receiving text messages, you're um, browsing the internet or using an app that where you connect to the internet. That data is captured. Uh, just your regular every day, your phone's sitting there and, and there's a connection, that is not. But generally, if there's data being transferred, it's being captured. And if you think back to the early days of cell phones when they first came out, you know, the they weren't necessarily creating all these records and designing for all these records to be kept to, you know, for investigators and forensics people like me. They were doing it so they could charge you. Because back in the day, you only had so much data. You only had so many minutes to talk. And they wanted to be able to track that so they knew when to charge you when you went over. Uh, so those are the purpose. That's really the purpose of it. Not really a spy on us, so they say. So, under, uh, so let's talk about cell towers. Uh, 
uh, a few things to point out when you when you end up looking and, and getting the results of the cell tower information is the cell phones will connect to the tower with the best signal, not necessarily geographically the closest one. And there may be really good reasons for that. Everything from you know there are big buildings in the way, weather. You know you're in a big stadium, so you're being load balanced over to another uh, another tower. Load balance is just a way for them to manage. Uh, all of the connections. Um, for the most part, towers have three antennas. That's for 4G and below. I'll uh, talk about that coming up. Uh, distances uh, is sometimes difficult to determine. Again, the records are not being kept so that we can, you know, um, spy on us. Uh, again, they're, you know, so general uh, location is not exact. Uh, this is what you're going to see. The results we get back, we get a GPS coordinate of the tower, we get the, the azimuth, the direction that the antenna is facing, and then we, we get a beam width. You know. uh, now, I say that, but that is all for 4G and below. We are now moving to 5G. You may have seen these commercials. And uh, these uh, 5G, they have, um, uh, they have 360 degree co uh, coverage. I'll show you an example coming up. So when we see that, you know, just 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 know that that's that's what you're getting. If you get that those cell tower records back, it's five G. That's what you're going to get. This is old school. These are regular four G and below. Uh, on the on the picture on the left, on the tower we're looking at in the middle is the regular, but the very top is a five G. So it's a, this cylindrical um, antenna at the very top. Also, if your carrier supports five G, you can. Um, you can look down at your phone and you'll see that you have 5G connection. But that's what it looks like. It's that cylinder right on the very top. Wouldn't even think anything of it. Uh, uh, this is an antenna trying to look like a palm tree and an antenna trying to look like a cactus. Uh, just for trivia, how far are these how far can the signal go? Uh, anywhere between 22 and 35 miles, but generally the antennas are a little closer together. We have a program that's called Cellhawk, and Cellhawk does a really, really good job. Uh, taking the raw data and uh, and presenting it to us in a map format and and this is what it will look like you may see you may not be able to see the text it may be too small on your screen but essentially what we have is a date and a time uh, we have the you know the shaded area is is showing uh, if we were to follow this person uh, they started in the upper right hand corner and they ended up uh, in the, the bottom of your screen, and there's text in there which shows date and time uh, of the connection. So one thing to point out here is when you're looking at this, just keep in mind that the phone can be outside the shaded area of what's shown on the map. We have to have the shaded area and somewhere, otherwise it gets uh, really, really messy and, and difficult to look at. They, they would all overlap. So. Uh, but this is uh, an accurate representation of uh, someone's travel. Uh, how long is cell site uh, location data stored? AT&T is later at seven years, and US Cellular and Verizon at one year since T-Mobile and Sprint have merged. Uh, we're still waiting to see if they're gonna keep everything for two years or cut it down to one. Um, this is, though, a good reason why I mentioned you know, preservation orders uh, early and often. If you think something is going to be important to you, data, connection data, cell tower data is going to be important, then uh, get that preservation out as early as you can because the data may not be there when you need it. This is a screenshot of my colleague. He has one of those apps on his phone from an insurance company that promises uh, lower rates if they let you uh, track him and um, follow his driving. Now, supposedly, the technology is so good that it differentiates between when you are a driver or when you are a passenger. So, if you're a passenger and your and and your friend is driving and driving crazy, you know, supposedly they know the difference. But anyway, this is a screenshot. And again, we're all talking about the you know the subject here is uh, location information, uh, figuring out where the user was at a certain time. This is one other place. Uh, one other place that we can use to uh, get this information. Uh, another screenshot of uh, my colleague driving from Tucson up to Phoenix. 
Uh, Fitbit Apple Watches, these are great devices because uh, they keep very accurate GPS information. In fact, when looking at the records, when you're using one of these health apps, it is not only grabbing your uh, GPS location one time every second, it's also capturing your heart rate. Um, and you may you may recall there's a case where you know somebody said they were sleeping in the middle of the night, yet their heart rate monitor showed quite a bit of activity in the middle of the night when they said they're sleeping. Um, they were actually committing a crime. So uh, that was very useful, but when you're um, but these apps are great because, like I said, one time per second they're reaching out, getting uh, GPS coordinates. Kind of makes sense because it's very accurate when you speed up or slow down. Um, we would generally get that from the, uh, like an Apple Watch, we wouldn't tear apart an Apple Watch to pull the data from it. It's being collected on the watch, but it's really being stored on the phone or up in the cloud. That's where we would go. Uh, I want to mention Strava. Strava is, uh, if, if you don't know what Strava is, um, people who work out a lot create either a private or public profile to work out. Uh, it's very social. They can challenge others to workouts. They can say, "Okay, let's meet up," you know, here after our our workout. Those kind of things. So, um, but what happened is uh, that some researchers were going through and looking at people's public profiles. They found that um, you know people, um, this one person was at least it looks like they were running, and um, it looks like they were running uh, along the perimeter of an airfield. The airfield was not publicly known. Supposedly, it was a CIA black site, and um, uh, I know the military has really cracked down, cracked down on the, um, the social media and sharing for uh, military members. And this is one example of why, uh, I don't, had he made his profile private, it wouldn't have been discovered. So, the next section I'm going to talk about uh, Facebook and Google data. So, if you have Facebook on your phone, uh, and if you have the Google app on your phone, or if you use an Android, you're going to have to have a Google account. So this data is, uh, so Google and Facebook are uh, creating location information, um, which is uh, what you can get from doing a Facebook uh, download or a Google export. I'll show you how to do those in a minute. But what I'm going to show you first are the results of that, and then I'm going to show you how to get it. So the results of doing a Facebook download, you're going to get a zip file on your computer. You unzip it. You can browse through all of that data just by clicking on the index at the very bottom. But I'm just going to show you where the good information is and, um, and what to look for. Um, under this security and login information, a couple different entries there. This shows devices used to log in. For example, Windows PC at the top. I have a location information, GPS, I have an IP address, which is partially, partially wiped out, but it's the IP address, so remember how important IP addresses are to uh, confirming the, the specific device that is connected. Uh, on the example below, iPhone XS Max, it shows a created and an updated time. So this is going to show the first time this device was used to log in to this Facebook account and the last time. Again, it has location information and an IP address there as well. Uh, has other information. I haven't whited out, but this is showing GPS coordinates, uh, date, time, and IP addresses of logging in to the account. And this login protection data, those are actually the cell phone towers used. So if you're, uh, this is when you're out and about uh, with your phone driving through, you're not at your home network. These are uh, GPS coordinates of towers being used when you're interacting with Facebook. Uh, even better than that, though, there's uh, depending on the settings, you may very well have a record that shows this. This is just one, this is partially one day, it's February 29th of this year. There are dozens of um, logs, log entries showing date and time and uh, IP location of where the device was at that time. Uh, this is a blown up version, but sometimes several times per hour, other times there's a little gap but a lot of location information is retrievable from uh, Facebook. I'll show you how to download it in a minute. I tried to uh, draw a correlation between what was, you know, what was the user doing at the time when this connection was made? Uh, were they browsing? Were they 
liking things? Were they commenting on things? Were they uploading things? I couldn't find a correlation between it. Um, if you can see it on the screen, there's a, this person liked an Instagram photo and at 416, yet there's no GPS coordinate. You would expect it to be there. I expected it to be there, but there wasn't. So, so uh, what prompts Facebook to grab your GPS location? Well, they just do whatever they want. Nothing, I couldn't point my finger at anything specific. So Google Takeout, again, I'll show you how to do all this in, in just a moment, but this is the results of what you're gonna see. Again, you're gonna get a zip file, and uh, you can browse through all of these things by using the uh, index at the very bottom, but if you have a full uh, file named location history, a lot of information just like Facebook, other places where you can get good information, of course, the Chrome browser, uh, it's not necessarily location information, but if you want to see what the person was doing, what, what sites they were browsing to, what they were searching for, their bookmarks, those kind of things. But under location history and my activity, a lot of information under my activity, there's search and maps. Uh, let's say you're looking for you know, a Home Depot on Ventura Boulevard. That would show up in, if you're using um, uh, maps, that would show up under search. Then you say, okay, take me there, then that's going to show up under maps. So how it looks uh, drawn out, this is a colleague of mine uh, walking through, uh, walking around Las Vegas. He was there to present at a conference. Um, this is what it looks like uh, driving from, uh, from this Google information driving from Tucson uh, up to Arizona and walking through. So we're going to talk about how to get it. Um, ideally, if the data is stored on the phone, we're going to want to collect it from the most original authentic source, which is the device that created the digital data. So it's gonna come from the phone. If we don't have the phone, then we're gonna look at what backups they may have made backup to your computer. You can use your iPhone to backup uh, certain files to the cloud, and then you can use uh, the different than that. There's backup and restore uh, from, uh, from your device for uh, maps that we talked about, or uh, you know, fitness apps. Those are gonna you're gonna need to log in, get a browser and log in to um, that. How to get it? So I see a question there, but I'll zip through this because we only have a few moments. I'm sorry, I ran out of time. But by the way, I'll stay as long as you want. So if you want to go longer, I'll stay as long as as long as you have questions. So how do you get it? You need to log into your uh, your account. And by the way. The reason I'm saying, and I mentioned this, and show you guys how to do this, is let's say your client is being accused of being in location A, he insists he was in location B. You can do these downloads, and you can look at this yourself. If it is helpful for you, I'd recommend you hire an independent third party to do the extraction. That way they can introduce it into court. But if it's not, then okay, well, you don't need to worry about that. You can move on to something else. Same for opposing. If opposing, you believe them to be in a certain location at any time, they say, nope, wasn't me, you can do this. Now, as forensics people, we generally don't like self-collections because um, the data can be modified on the way to getting to you. Um, so, but in this case, this data is being stored by someone else. It's being stored by Facebook, it's being stored by Google. When we go back in and collect it, there's, there's nothing the user could have changed in there. To, and so it's generally so it's okay to do this. I'd also recommend you do this personally, or for yourself, for your own privacy. Uh, number one, it creates a backup of the data. Uh, number two, you'll be aware of what Facebook and how much Facebook and Google are tracking you. You decide whether you know you decide how you feel about that. If you want to make any changes, so how do you do it? You go to uh, log into your account. Go to takeout.google.com, and you'll see a screen that looks like this. The default is to accept everything. Uh, and to download everything, you don't have to do that. You can be selective, but uh, the default is to do that. Scroll to the bottom uh, and go to next steps and go ahead and accept the defaults there and you will soon get that. If you want to do a quick check, uh, open another tab, go to google.com slash maps slash timelines. If you see a lot of red dots, you are being uh, actively, <laughs> persistently tracked. Uh, this is what it, you can, you can uh, narrow it down to a certain time frame. But if you look, uh, and you don't see any red dots, and in the lower left-hand corner, you see uh, location history is off. It means that the um, the most chronic tracking is off. doesn't mean there won't be other tracking, 
much of the data that I already showed you about logging in and, and those kind of things, that will that will still be there. For Facebook, log into your account. Hit that drop down arrow, go to settings, go to your Facebook information, and then hit download your information. Uh, again, go ahead and just accept the defaults, they're just fine. The default is to accept everything, collect everything you don't need to, but um, go ahead and, and uh, follow the steps. You'll see that they are working on it. They may need you to enter your password again, and pretty soon you'll end up with a zip file. For Instagram and Twitter, uh, there isn't the location information that is uh, on Facebook and Google, mostly when you set up your account where you were at that time. So if somebody set up a fake account and is using it to harass someone, uh, if we get into that account, we could get the uh, IP location and the GPS location of where they were when they did that. Amazon makes it uh, difficult, but you really don't get any good information from them other than a listing of the all the addresses that they ever sent any packages to. That's about the only location information from Amazon. Um, so if it's your client, you can have them log in to Facebook and Google and download the information. If it's opposing or if it's any cell tower information, you need a warrant issued by a judge um, or a subpoena from you and consent from the account owner. You need consent. Uh, that's because the Stored Communications Act specifically prohibits a subpoena alone from obtaining that data. So uh, this brings me to the end of our presentation. I'm sorry I'm a minute over, but like I said, I will stay as long as you want. For those that have, I want to be respectful of your time. For those that have to leave, thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, spending the last hour with me. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and contact us. Uh, so I do see a question here. Do I recommend any apps or programs enforce data privacy other than wiping? Uh, so I would, there are, there are guides online which will show you how to uh, uh, step up your privacy for both apps and for your phone. And uh, if you if you get a hold of me offline, I'll be more than happy to share some of those with you. Uh, they are, um, but uh, for, if you delete it, uh, the follow-up question, uh, the second question there, if I delete a photo and it can be recovered by Cellbrite, how can I actually delete the photo so that it's not recoverable? Um, from a user point of view, you know, you either delete it or you don't. I'm not familiar with any apps that securely and guarantee deletion of pictures. I'd be kind of suspicious of any of any program that uh, that I allow access to pictures because I think if I were a hacker, I'd probably sign a program that says, you know, let me have access to this, you know, very sensitive photo, and I'll make sure my program deletes it because I would think that they would then send it to them. And you get blackmailed. I'd be really suspicious of that. So um, I hope that answered your question. What impact does Safari's private browsing option have on data recovery? Yeah, that stuff doesn't work. Uh, we, we pull that information out anyway. It, it does more to protect the end website from identifying who you are. It does not stop the history being made of, uh, from, from the end user. And yeah, so that stuff, that stuff, you know, in private browsing mode and everything, you know, minimal, uh, minimal benefit from that. Um, yeah, we, we can see that stuff. So, all right, so we are, oh, let me throw another poll out. If you don't mind for those that are still here, and I appreciate you staying late. And uh, this is pretty much asking what you found most beneficial. Like I mentioned, what we, what I think is most beneficial and what I think would be most helpful may not be what you find helpful. So we want to provide information that's helpful for you. And so the results are coming in about half so far are more than half. Overall knowledge of using cell phones as evidence, 
And, but overall location data at Google Facebook is catching up. Nobody cared about specifics of metadata. Well, okay, sorry. Now those are coming in. So uh, any other questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. And again, thank you. So I don't see any new information coming in and it looks like the polls are slowing down. So I'll go ahead and publish this. Oh, I see a chat. You're welcome. Okay, I'll go ahead. Uh, I'll go ahead and send the last poll out. About one third overall knowledge, one third uh, overall location data, some specifics of metadata, and then Google Facebook info. So, see, I think the Google Facebook info is the most is the scariest from a privacy perspective. From an investigative point of view, it's great, but for privacy, not so much. Okay, so again, thank you very much. Uh, one last question. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, the question is about Snapchat. Uh, sometimes uh, it depends. Sometimes we can get those still um, pulled off the phone. Um, it really does depend on you know these 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 app developers. They're they're you know they can Google and they can figure out what we can pull off of phones and they can see. And you know they're concerned about privacy for their clients, and they're always trying to stay one step ahead of us. And we're always trying to, you know, it, it's it's the spy versus spy, um, you know, cat and mouse game. So we're generally on the investigative side, a couple steps behind, but you know, but not always. So, um, I, so the answer is 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 sometimes. Like I said, I don't, I'm not trying to not answer the question. It's just. It just it depends. So. All right. Any more questions before we wrap it up? I see my numbers are dwindling, so people are dropping off. So uh, thank you. And again, any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, we do have other webinars, so uh, check it out. And uh, I hope you have a great day.